Live from Boston, my name is Emilio Madrigal, and today is October 2nd, 2020. I am joined remotely by my good friend and colleague, Rafat Manan, who is at UPenn in Philadelphia. Today, we continue our pulmonary pathology series with Drs. Colby and Drs. Dr. Leslie, who are both professors emeriti of laboratory medicine and pathology at the Mayo Clinic. Today's lecture is going to be led by Dr. Colby with commentary by Dr. Leslie, and it's titled Additional Patterns of Lung Fibrosis and Inflammatory Infiltrates in ILD. As always, please feel free to post comments, questions, and we'll make sure to pass those along to both Drs. Colby and Leslie at the end of the session. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Colby. but I'm happy to get up and speak to you all today about non-neoplastic lung disease. This is the second lecture that we're doing, and these lectures are designed to be sort of a basic approach to non-neoplastic lung disease, talking about individual entities along the way. Today's lecture, which is number two, is additional patterns of lung fibrosis and comments on inflammatory infiltrates in interstitial lung disease. The format will include like case presentations, discussion of cellular infiltrates, a discussion of patterns of fibrosis, and some specific disease entities to be mentioned. The disease entities are also shown on this slide, and there are some references, and I won't go through these at all on this slide, because this PDF will be available, and you will be able to get references off the PDF, and you will also be able to get lists for differential diagnosis and helpful clues in assessing interstitial lung disease off a of PDF. So this lecture is more of a visual presentation of things. Uh, hopefully you will see some things that you will then be able to re refer back to if dealing with individual cases. And as discussed previously by Dr. Leslie, when we deal with non-neoplastic lung disease, we can't just look at the slide and make a diagnosis. We have to think about information from four domains. Why did this patient present to the doctor? What are the clinical and laboratory findings? What does the radiologist find? And helpful, particularly helpful, is what does the radiologist think the differential diagnosis is? Because that can often help us. And then our job is to identify the pathologic injury pattern or patterns. And then putting this all together, we come up with a disease entity that fits. And at the end of the day, we need to know what the clinical question is. In other words, what questions am I answering with this biopsy? And if what I think I'm answering is not the problem that the clinician did the biopsy for, then we have an issue. And that's why thinking about this in four different domains is useful, reminding us that it's not just a pathologic pattern as in tumor diagnosis in the setting of non-neoplastic lung disease. So we'll start with a whole amount of a lung biopsy, and we've decided to do away with, at least I have decided to do away with trying to do an aperio slide. This is just a scanning shot from the aperio scanner showing lung that has obviously too much blood. Then the arrows point to some areas where it gets a little cellular, and in reviewing a case like this, your eye should be drawn to the areas that are more than just blood. And if we look at those areas, we can see that there's inflammatory cells there and a lot of blood in the alveoli. A little higher power, we identify neutrophils that are in the interstitium. They're surrounding a little vessel. This is not just routine pneumonia as you see at autopsy with neutrophils in air spaces. This is interstitial neutrophils. And when you see those, think about capillaritis. And when you think about capillaritis, then you're dealing with what are called pulmonary hemorrhage syndromes or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. So if we go back to our four domains on the case that we just looked at, we have a pathologic injury pattern of alveolar hemorrhage with capillaritis. There's lots of things that can cause that, so we need more information. Radiologically, there's patchy airspace disease. In this case, that's not very helpful. There's acute shortness of breath and hemoptysis and anemia. Also not that helpful, although anemia tells you that the hemorrhage is significant. And then most significantly, there's a positive PR3 ANCA. And with all that information, then we can come up with a diagnosis of alveolar hemorrhage consistent with 
granulomatosis with polyangiitis or what was formerly known as Wegener's granulomatosis. Now, that, at low power in that first slide, you saw there was a lot of blood. And your initial question when there's blood in the lung is, it, is, is it related to the biopsy procedure or is it an alveolar hemorrhage syndrome? And the most common cause of blood in a biopsy, even a transbronchial biopsy, is secondary hemorrhage from the procedure itself. And what you see on the right-hand side there is massive hemorrhage from a lot of surgical manipulation. Now you can look histologically and sometimes determine if it's alveolar hemorrhage or not, but it's actually quite simple just to get the history and find, because you're gonna do that anyway, and find out if alveolar hemorrhage is a reasonable thought. An alveolar hemorrhage syndrome or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is pulmonary hemorrhage that is not due to trauma, airway disease, tumors, or heart failure. In other words, it's not due to the common causes of bleeding. And this is a form of acute lung injury with bleeding in the lung that was previously mentioned by Dr. Leslie, but I wanted to underscore it. This is an important thing to be aware of in patients with acute interstitial lung disease. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage can be divided into the ANCA-associated causes, the anti-GBM disease or classic good pasture syndrome, it can be caused by immune complexes, particularly in connective tissue diseases, and it can be due to an immunologic mechanism that has not been defined, such as in children with idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis. From a practical point of view, this is the differential diagnosis that you be, should be considering. Vasculitis, most commonly granulomatosis with polyangiitis, connective tissue disease, most commonly lupus, anti-GBM disease, idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis and various miscellaneous causes, including drug reactions. This is uncommon, but it's a medical emergency and it's worthwhile being able to readily think of the differential diagnosis. So in summary, in diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, we have acute injury and you can see on the upper left there, acute injury with fibrin as Dr. Leslie showed you, but now there's a lot of red cells caught up in the fibrin. And when you see that sort of thing, or when you see hemosiderin, then you can be pretty sure that the blood that you see in the lung is real and not simply related to the trauma of the biopsy. Like other acute injury, hemorrhage organizes with rounded airspace organization, as you see there on the bottom frame in the lower right. In some cases, you will see capillaritis. Now, it's not always present in alveolar hemorrhage, but when it is present, it's a useful clue that this is a significant injury, number one, and that it is alveolar hemorrhage, number two. And then with time, of course, you get hemosiderin. And later on in the course of a patient's disease, you may see lots and lots of hemosiderin. What do you do with hemosiderin in the lung? Actually, hemosiderin is important to identify. And in consult cases, I think it's not uncommon for pathologists not to have appreciated hemosiderin that's present. If you think it's there, do a Prussian blue stain. It's easy enough. What are the most common causes? Well, the most common cause is probably smoking these days with fine granular hemosiderin positivity. The other, most, the other common cause would be cardiac disease, patients that have unrelated congestive heart failure, for example, and secondary hemosiderin-laden macrophages. Then there's a long list of less common things such as occupational exposure and other things that can cause hemosiderin. Main point, smoking and cardiac disease are your number one and number two things. Further down the list, you'll come to diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. I want to move on now to talking about cellular infiltrates in the lung. The lung obviously has lots of cellular infiltrates and one could spend two or three lectures talking about cellular infiltrates. And I wanted to try to summarize cellular infiltrates in a few slides and leave you with some differential diagnoses that you can refer to at a later time. Eosinophils. Eosinophils are not that common in lung disease, but when you see them, they're very helpful. Usually they're seen in large numbers, as you see here. You, they can be associated with fibrin and acute eosinophilic pneumonia is one of the causes or one of the forms of acute lung injury. And like other lung injuries, when eosinophilic injuries organize, they organize with the pattern of organizing pneumonia as you see there on the upper right. How many eosinophils are significant? I don't think we have a 
a researched number that is significant, I'd usually say 10 to 15 in a high power field. In other words, when you begin to see clusters of eosinophils and not just one or two. And if you can get to that eosinophilic pneumonia differential diagnosis, it's really pretty small. And you can see, uh, by the way, uh, can you all take my image off the right? I can't see the full side, the right hand side of my slides. I see the uh, image, I see Kevin's face and my face. At any rate, eosinophilic pneumonia provides you with a relatively small differential diagnosis that you can work from and discuss with the clinician. Well, let's move on from lymphocytes to eosinophils. Lymphocytes are common all over the body, and to see a few in the lung is common and very nonspecific. Plasma cells, similarly, a few plasma cells are common and not very specific. When you see a lot of plasma cells, then your differential is going to get a little bit smaller again. You're going to start thinking of immunologic disease, such as connective tissue disease, drug, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, IgG4 disease, immunoglobulin disorders, and lymphoproliferative disease. Also narrowing the differential is lymphoid hyperplasia with germinal centers, not just small lymphoid aggregates, but good germinal centers. Then your differential includes primarily connective tissue disease, immunodeficiency syndromes, and chronic infections can also do it. And then of course, when you have sheets of lymphocytes, sheets of lymphoid cells, you don't even need to get off low power to know that you're dealing in the setting of a lymphoproliferative disease, such as the a small lymphocytic lymphoma presenting in the lung on the left-hand side. So commentary there, I've tried to talk very quickly about lymphocytes and eosinophils just to give you an idea and leave you with some differential diagnoses that you can refer to later. Kevin, any comments? Well, one thing, Tom, if you wanna get rid of my mug off the screen, just click that little minimize at the top left of that ah, box. A wizard. Sorry about that. Yeah. So. Um, that was a great overview of the process. And, you know, I think it emphasizes to me what someone asked me yesterday in a lecture. Uh, the question came up is, you know, I find something on the slide. How do I know that it's really relevant? And it's, it's troubling to pathologists because I think most of the time we're used to approaching a biopsy for neoplasm in which we don't really have to ask too many questions. If you see cancer cells in the biopsy, you've already solved the case. So you're the one who comes up with the, the plum on the end of your thumb saying, aha, I solved the problem. With ILD and diffuse parenchymal lung disease, pathology is just a piece. And you need to know all those pieces, but you need to take it back to the clinical presentation, as Tom said. It's, it's one part and often is not the part that's gonna solve the entire case. Okay, let's move on, and we'll start with another case, a scan slide of a case. And now at low power, it's not quite so uniform. There's a little variation from one place to the other. Some alveoli are easier to see in that it looks whiter and there's less space in the alveoli. Elsewhere, it looks a little bit different. We go to a little higher power, a little higher power yet, so what do we have? We have some lymphocytes in the bottom, but they're not making a follicle. We can just say, yeah, there's lymphocytes and there's other things going on. But the main thing in the upper right-hand image is there's organizing pneumonia. So the, the low power reason that the slide wasn't quite so uniform was that the more solid areas had organizing pneumonia. And you've heard about organizing pneumonia from Dr. Leslie has a relatively long differential, but a few common things, bugs, drugs, connective tissue disease, and idiopathic. This happened to be a drug reaction. This was a patient on nitrofurantoin who developed pulmonary infiltrates and got better when the drug was stopped and she was put on steroids. So that brings us to patterns of lung fibrosis. And we can be very broad in how we define fibrosis, or we can be fairly narrow. If we remain fairly broad, organizing pneumonia has often been caused, called fibrosis. It's not technically fibrosis because there's not a lot of collagen, but it's also often been included. That's a major pattern. The other major pattern of, quote, fibrosis is usual interstitial pneumonia, or UIP, and those were introduced to you by Dr. Leslie previously. But I wanna talk about some other patterns of fibrosis in the lung that a pathologist should be at least familiar with if not able to identify on a slide. That is the diffuse fibrosis as seen in 
fibrotic NSIP, central lobular fibrosis, smoking-related fibrosis. It's extremely common once you realize to look for it, and elastosis or elastotic fibrosis. So here, of course, is what? Organizing pneumonia. The lung architecture is actually intact and there's granulation tissue mostly within air spaces. And it's once you recognize this, it's a pretty easy low power diagnosis with those edematous plugs of organization. The effuse alveolar damage organizes in a similar way, although it's more widespread and extensive in the lung, but the same process is there, intraluminal organization. And when you see either organizing diffuse alveolar damage or organizing pneumonia, these are the main things in your differential, as I mentioned previously. I do include local reaction here because sometimes you'll see organizing pneumonia in a needle biopsy around a mass lesion, and that means it's probably a local reaction, if not the actual cause of the lesion itself. It can be more localized. Usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP type fibrosis is seen in these three images on the left. It's often subplural and patchy. The middle shows honeycomb change where the lung tissue is frankly destroyed and there are abnormal spaces. And in UIP, there's evidence of activity with fibroblast foci that is ongoing injury that is organizing with fibroblasts. The key in UIP is that there's destruction and loss of lung architecture that's not gonna come back. And the goal of therapy these days is not to reverse this process, but to arrest it and stop it. Differential for UIP is seen here. IPF itself, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, chronic HP, and some other things. And now that list will be available on the PDF of this lecture. Well, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia is a term that clinicians use and pathologists use for a pattern of injury that is generally temporally uniform temporally homogeneous and uniform in the lung, and it can be mostly cellular, as on the upper right, or mostly fibrotic. There's a spectrum there. And contrast, NSIP on the left, note the uniformity. UIP on the right, note the patchiness, note the clear loss of lung architecture. Even in more severe cases of fibrotic NSIP, there it can be quite extensive, but the basic lung architecture is still visible both on the left and the right, although it's now being distorted by fibrosis. Key pattern, it's diffuse and does not have prominent fibroblast foci. Comparison again to UIP, a patchy process that often leads to honeycomb change. NSIP is seen in these three main conditions, connective tissue disease, drug reaction, and idiopathic. And 90 to 95 percent of cases that may come here across your desk as biopsies will fit into these three categories. Most commonly probably would be connective tissue disease, chronic HP and drug reaction are also relatively common as well. What about this kind of fibrosis? Now uh, you can see in the center, this kind of fibrosis is clearly fibrotic. It's eosinophilic and quite collagenized. And even on the right hand slide with a little bit different staining, you can see dense hyalinized sclerosis. On the left, it's just in the subpleural regions. And this is smoking-related interstitial fibrosis, which is a nice name for that because we really believe smoking causes this fibrosis. And if you look in your lobectomy specimens, you'll find it. Smoking-related fibrosis is often subpleural. It's posicellular, not a lot of lymphocytes or other cells. And it's somewhat hyaline appearing. Since these patients are smokers, they commonly have smokers macrophages, as you see on the right-hand panel. The finding in the two middle and left image are just an incidental finding at lobectomy. And if you go to your next lung cancer resection for smoking, look in the subpleural regions and you'll see this as usually an incidental asymptomatic finding. It can become more extensive, as you see on the right-hand side, uh, where there is more diffuse involvement of the lung and the patients have interstitial lung disease and a variety of names have been applied to this, such as desquamative interstitial pneumonia or fibrotic NSIP in a smoker. And I won't get into that rather esoteric argument. Moving on to other patterns of fibrosis. What about at low power if you look down and you see evidence of fibrosis, but it shows a distinct bronchiolocentric pattern? That's a useful finding in terms of differential diagnosis. You may see that as peribronchiolar metaplasia on the left, 
or as just central lobular areas of scarring around where the airway should be, as you see on the right-hand side, without a lot of peribronchiolar metaplasia. Pattern of fibrosis that I think pathologists should be at least knowledgeable about and probably able to identify. Here are the main things that you're gonna think about when you see central lobular fibrosis. After an infection, of course, connective tissue disease, collagen vascular disease, pulmonary lung or hot cell histocytosis, chronic HP aspiration, and other things. Now, pulmonary lung or hot cell histocytosis, or PLCH, produces a very distinct pattern of central lobular fibrosis that you see here. On the left-hand side, you can see that that area of stellate scarring is in the central lobular regions because it spares the pleura above. It's very stellate, it's very, it has a little emphysema around it, and this is what the healed or late phase of pulmonary lung or hot cell histocytosis looks like. And the key adjectives there are stellate central lobular scarring. And that's a very distinctive finding once you're able to recognize it. Moving on now to elastotic fibrosis. So there are lots of different kinds of fibrosis in the lung. Elastotic fibrosis tends to be in the subpleural regions. Now you will commonly see this in an apical cap which is on the surf apex of the upper lobes as an incidental finding. But when this becomes more widespread, you have interstitial lung disease. Elastic tissue stains are obviously going to be positive. Higher power, sometimes you can see the curly Q elastic fibers on H&E. Doing an elastic tissue stain often shows prominent elastosis, sometimes with background elastosis of recognizable alveolar architecture. This kind of elastosis is seen in the conditions listed here, main one being idiopathic pulmonary parenchymal fibroelastosis or pleural parenchymal fibroelastosis following bone marrow transplant and then in other conditions. And as I said, these differential diagnoses lists will be on a PDF. Well, we've looked at some cases of fibrosis. Let's now look at an unknown case. Here is a low power, medium power shot of a lung biopsy. Clearly there's evidence of fibrosis. A little higher power, you can see there's some fibrosis, not a lot of inflammatory cells, maybe a few lymphocytes here and there. So let's think about this case from our four domains. What we have is a pathologic pattern that we can call fibrotic NSIP, fairly diffuse, fairly uniform, no fibroblast foci. It's not central lobular and we don't see any granulomas. So what do we do think about when we see an NSIP pattern? There's our main differential there, CBD, drug, HP, and idiopathic. Let's learn more about the patient. The patient has chronic dyspnea, no connective tissue disease, no collagen vascular disease or exposure. Now the radiologist is a little helpful here. The radiologist says this is not UIP, that's useful information for us in our interpretation and also says it's consistent with NSIP because radiologists can identify what they call an NSIP pattern. It's not always right, but they can be a helpful uh, bit of information. So in summary then, what are we dealing with? The disease entity that fits is idiopathic NSIP, which would be probably the disease entity that you would work out with your clinician as you're discussing this case. Let's look at another case, and I'll give you a trichrome and an elastic tissue stain. And if there's an elastic tissue stain, that should be a clue, because you can see there's a fair bit of elastic tissue there on the bottom. And this is fibrosis in this kind of case, as you see with the blue trichrome at the top. It's subpleural in distribution, that's helpful. Higher power, we see our curly Q elastotic fibers. So we're dealing with elastotic fibrosis. Now, how are we going to deal with this case? Let's look at uh, what we do. Here is what such a case would look like grossly. It tends to be subpleural. Sometimes you can see that grayish elastic tissue extending down around bronchovascular bundles. Elastotic fibrosis is our pathologic pattern. The differential for that is idiopathic pleural parenchymal fibroelastosis, status post drug, uh, lung or bone marrow transplant, drug reaction, or connective tissue disease. Those would be the main things that this has been described in when it is a diffuse process. Let's find out about this patient. Bilateral interstitial lung disease, chronic dyspnea. 
CT here is again helpful. There's an upper lobe subpleural infiltrates that is bigger than an apical cap. So that this pa pattern is very distinctive radiologically. Since there's no cause, this would be idiopathic PPFE or idiopathic pleural parenchymal fibrolelastosis. Tends to be more common in women than men, particularly in the sixth decade. And this kind of fibrosis is being identified in more and more settings. Sometimes as an additional finding in somebody who has something else in the lower lobes. Well, let's take a step back and ask, how do clinicians view pulmonary fibrosis? Just recently, the clinicians are lumping cases into progressive fibrosing interstitial lung diseases, and there's some references for this on the bottom. And why are they doing that? <clears throat> because they're, they have limited treatment options and they're lumping these together because they all, uh, whether it's UIP from IPF or UIP from something else, they all seem to progress. So they're being treated similarly and they're called progressive fibrosing interstitial lung diseases. Regard, regardless of what the clinicians think, as pathologists, we should continue to be splitters because the, the clinician can take our split diagnosis and lump it back together. But from what we do, we should continue to be splitters in how we view these cases. Commentary, Kevin. Well, Tom, I, I think the audience would, would appreciate your making a comment about the most common way they're going to see this, these patterns that you've described. And that's going to be with the bronchoscopy biopsy. Uh, transbronch uh, cryobiopsy. Do you, think, do you think it's possible to be a splitter in that context with the patterns you've described? Well, we'll talk a little bit about biopsies in a few minutes, but mostly what I'm showing you are pictures from surgical lung biopsies. Surgical lung biopsies are being done less and less, and some places are doing cryobiopsies and some places are doing transbronchial biopsies. A lot of these patterns are, you need to see a pattern and you can't see a pattern in a small forceps transbronchial biopsy. So you are left with being more descriptive, but we'll come back to that. But in general, to identify patterns of lung injury, be it fibrosis or cellular infiltrates, you need, if you wanna see the pattern, you need a bigger specimen, either a cryobiopsy or a VATS surgical lung biopsy. Well, I wanna move on to smoking because we've realized that smoking is a big deal in interstitial lung disease. It does a lot more than cause COPD and cancer. It produces a condition called respiratory bronchiolitis associated ILD, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And if you, you may go back and look, some cases of eosinophilic pneumonia are smoking related. Now, everybody that smokes gets respiratory bronchiolitis. They're irritating their small airways at the respiratory bronchiole, and there's gonna be a secondary inflammatory reaction that includes a few lymphocytes and pigmented macrophages that will stain with iron. And as I said, just about everybody who smokes an appreciable amount will get a little bit of subpleural scarring in the their lobectomy that we call, call smoking-related interstitial fibrosis, SRIF. Well, what is RBILD? RBILD is an exaggerated respiratory bronchiolitis reaction where enough lung tissue is involved that you have radiologic findings that are subtle but present. You have a lot of airspace macrophages now accumulated around central lobular regions, and that's all it is. There's enough alveoli compromised that there's compromise of lung function, RBILD. DIP is generally seen in smokers, if you, whether or not you believe in it, but I won't get into that, that issue. Now the airspace macrophages are even more widespread and the patients are a little more symptomatic. Again, symptomatic due to airspace compromised by lots and lots of macrophages. Well, that brings us to back to cellular infiltrates and talking about macrophages. And the lung is no different from anywhere in the body. Any slide you pick up is gonna have a few histiocytes or macrophages around. So seeing a few, as you see in this alveolus on the upper left, seeing two or three is no big deal. But when you begin to see large numbers of macrophages in the airspaces, that's the clue to a list of things that can cause that. Now, a few are common and nonspecific, but the first thing you could, should think about when you see a lot of macrophages is smoking-related injury or obstruction or even aspiration. Chronic hemorrhage is getting down in the differential. Heart failure is often an incidental finding, but can do it. 
a long list of things that can cause an accumulation of macrophages. For example, when you breathe in dusts, it's the macrophages that are gonna phagocytize those dusts and macrophages are common in pneumoconiosis. Let's go back to a case. Now there's obviously a lot of macrophages there. They're a little bit foamy. So you might wonder, are they foamy enough to think of the things that cause foamy macrophages like amiodarone toxicity? I probably would have thought about that here, but a little bit of foaminess to macrophages is common and nonspecific. Well, what else is going on here? What are these cells here? Now we've got five eosinophils in a cluster there. We look around, we see more eosinophils. So all of a sudden we've gone from a case that has a few macrophages, which is a very common thing, to a case that has lots of eosinophils, and we're back to our eosinophilic pneumonia pathologic pattern and the various things that can cause eosinophilic pneumonia, and I list them again here in your differential for a case of eosinophilic pneumonia. What about this case? Obviously too many macrophages, well, you, even in this small field, and this could be a field from a transbronchial biopsy, for example, even in this small field, you're gonna say there's hemocytin related macrophages, and if you didn't believe you could do it Prussian blue to prove it. Most common cause, smoking. Clinically, this patient has no evidence of an alveolar hemorrhage syndrome, so you can say the patient's a smoker. And then you can see this dense eosinophilic collagen, and you can say there's a little bit of smoking related interstitial fibrosis here. So this could be an incidental finding in a smoker, or this could be part of a diffuse disease related to smoking or desquama of interstitial pneumonia or respiratory bronchiolitis. So the, the only way to know how significant this is, is to put it in the clinical context, to go back to our four domains and find out what's the clinical story and what are the radiologic findings. Now, as, as we've gone through this lecture, I've tried to introduce to you most of the famous idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, or IIPs, the UIP, the NSIP, RBILD, et cetera. And I just want to point out, and in, there's a reference early on, that talks about how clinicians view idiopathic interstitial pneumonias these days. They have a major category, which we've talked about a minor category, which we really haven't talked about except for PPFE. And then of course, there's always unclassifiable. Any table needs an unclassifiable because we are not perfect most of the time. Well, Kevin brought this up, but what about lung biopsies? Your three, or your four, your three major types of lung biopsies that you're gonna see in patients with interstitial lung disease are a forceps biopsy, a cryobiopsy, and a surgical lung biopsy. And the images on the left show you the approximate size comparison for those three kinds of biopsies. You could think of them as small, medium, and large. Forceps biopsies are gonna be diagnostic and ILD in about 35% of cases. Cryobiopsies in about 75 to 85% of cases, assuming you get a good cryobiopsy and you know what you're looking at. You can see some patterns there, but of course they're not gonna be as good as the biggest specimen, which is the surgical lung biopsy. So a forceps biopsies, more often than not, two out of three times are gonna be non-diagnostic in ILD. That's frustrating for clinicians, but it's a fact of life. Sometimes you can still address that question. Do the findings in this biopsy answer the clinical question? And sometimes they do. And I'll show you some examples how a forceps biopsy can be helpful. Tiny little specimen, obviously too many eosinophils. This is fairly easy for you to get back to that Pathologic injury pattern that's looking like eosinophilic pneumonia, does it answer the clinical question? That's always what you're asking yourself. This is patchy infiltrates in an asthmatic. So yes, this is probably eosinophilic pneumonia related to this patient's underlying under condition of asthma and its associated lung findings. And actually, if you go back to this same specimen and look in the airway, you can see eosinophils in the mucosa in the, within the bronchial lining cell, in the bronchial lining cells, a common finding in asthma. What about this forceps biopsy? What do we have there? We'd have a small piece of tissue, but that's a pretty easy diagnosis for organizing pneumonia. Few lymphocytes there, but remember that's a common nonspecific finding. So the injury pattern is organizing pneumonia. You're given no history, and this is, of course, a common finding these days, and that we've been talking about this since the 
dawn of per surgical pathology, this has been the bane of our existence, not getting adequate clinical history. The electronic record has helped that out. Well, what do you do? You can't get the guy on the phone and his record has not been transcribed into the EMR yet. So you can be descriptive. You can say and give a differential diagnosis. You can say focus of organizing pneumonia, non-specific finding, but could be seen in and then list the sorts of things that organizing pneumonia, generally infection, drug reaction, and connective tissue disease. How about this forceps biopsy? There's an arrow pointing to something there. That's pinch artifact. And that's one of the reasons why cryobiopsies are nice is that they don't have this pinch artifact because it's freezing tissue and ripping it out rather than squeezing it and tearing it out. So along with pinch artifact, is anything abnormal there? But you don't want to overinterpret pinch artifact as fibrosis. So there's probably nothing there. What do you do? You'd be descriptive and say unremarkable lung biopsy or lung tissue with biopsy artifact, non-diagnostic, or you could simply say non-diagnostic histologically unremarkable lung tissue. It does not answer the clinical question, but I think it's worthwhile in a case like this to emphasize that it's non-diagnostic because then the patient can be further managed. Another transbronchial biopsy, forceps biopsy, this is fairly easy. There's obviously granulomas there, non-necrotizing, coalescing granulomas with fibrosis. That's typical of sarcoidosis, and we often see sarcoidosis in small biopsies. And we can say, we can go beyond just saying granulomas, we can say coalescing granulomas, non-necrotizing with surrounding fibrosis, consistent with sarcoid. <clears throat> When you know the clinical question, you can say something like this, as you see here, of course, you're gonna do your immunostains. Technically, this could be some other granulomatous process, but in the right clinical setting, one can be reasonably confident with a biopsy like that, that is that it's sarcoid, but the key there is in the right clinical setting, in the right radiologic setting, getting back to that domain of answering all those four issues. Kevin showed you this last time, and I won't go through this, uh, giving you an idea of how often transbronchial biopsy versus cryobiopsy versus surgical biopsy are, are diagnostic in a variety of conditions. And I won't go through those. I leave that for your PowerPoint or your PDF file to go back to and look to for comment. So Tom, you know, uh, I'm thinking of the, our, our consult practice and when we get cases from somewhere else that we can't get to the medical record. And for me, the, the main disadvantage to not having the complete clinical record is that I'm gonna to have to issue a longer report. So I'm gonna to have to do what you just said, which is <clears throat> we have a finding, I'm gonna to have to list the possibilities <clears throat> and I'm gonna to have to talk about what the CT imaging might be for these different conditions. So I end up with quite a long report as opposed to when I have the clinical record and the radiology in front of me. So <clears throat> the advantage of course is the more you know, the more questions you can answer. You know, as, as a corollary to that, I, I think if you're struggling with a case like that, you can always include a comment that says you will be happy to reassess a case if additional history is forthcoming. And that actually then puts the tennis ball back on the other side of the court with the clinician, uh, particularly recalcitrant, clinicians that are remiss in giving information. Now, you know, you can say, well, you guys are, you know, the consultants, it's easier for you, easy for you to do that. But it's not, a, it's not an unreasonable thing to point out that additional information may help in, in sorting out a, a very uh, case. And Tom, I've never encountered a clinician that when you can finally get in touch with them, who isn't excited about talking about their patient's disease? Yeah, well, the key thing there is when you can finally get in touch with them. Okay, let's say you've got a case and you're struggling with it and you decide that you need help. When do you need to get help with non-neoplastic lung disease? Well, there's really a couple of ways of thinking about that. <clears throat> this is a corollary what just we were just talking about. You get help with a case when you know that the four domains that you're dealing with are at odds. In other words, the clinician says, well, there's no way that it could be disease X that you think you see pathologically. And, and that sort of <clears throat> problem when the domains are at odds, or when you <clears throat> ask yourself, have I answered the clinical question? 
which is why is this patient dyspneic? And you say, no, I don't have an explanation for why is this patient dyspneic? So those are the times when you should consider getting help, sending the case for uh, consultation, sharing with a colleague, that sort of thing. Well, we've gone through part one of this course. We've gone through part two. Part three will be approach to granulomatous disease in approximately a month, which will be given by Dr. Leslie. And it's now time for us to take questions. Are you guys still there? Stop sharing cream. I think they're tooling up the questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kobe. Uh, I see some questions online. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. The first question is uh, how to differentiate. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, the question is what is the incidence of unclassified ILD in biopsy in real practice? Okay, well, that's an, that, that, that's an interesting question because that diagnosis of unclassified ILD is not a diagnosis that we pathologists make. That's a diagnosis that the clinicians make after multidisciplinary discussion, after all those four domains are discussed. So uh, I, I, su I suspect the question has to do, how often is a biopsy unclassifiable from the pathologist point of view? And that really depends on your experience and, and whether you're a lumper or a splitter. So most biopsies, I can say I favor one pattern over another, whereas another pathologist might say, have a somewhat lesser percent. Uh, I, a better question is how often is a surgical lung biopsy non-diagnostic? Probably 5% of the time. Uh, for, for an inexperienced observer, probably 15 or 20% of the time. So that will depend on how much experience the person has. With a forceps biopsy, the you know, 60, uh, two thirds of the cases are gonna be non-diagnostic or quote unclassifiable, but technically that term unclassifiable is a clinic, clinical term. So what should we be doing as pathologists? We should be giving a description of what we see. Patchy interstitial fibrosis with focal inflammation, insufficient features for a definitive diagnosis of say usual interstitial pneumonia or chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis or whatever is being considered. We should, we should think of more tabulating the findings that we have rather than just saying it doesn't fit the perfect pattern, therefore it is unclassifiable. That's the unclassifiable designation comes after everything's put together clinically. Yeah, and also I would add, Tom, that our, we have, you have to keep thinking of our job as being data collectors. When you get that biopsy, your job is to make a list on a piece of paper next to the microscope of everything you see in the biopsy. That's the starting point. Now, depending on your expertise and experience, you may look at the findings and assemble them into a differential diagnosis that's pretty narrow, like three or four things. But the first job is to tabulate the actual findings that you see in the slide. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. I mean, Kevin and I see a lot of this stuff and most of the time we can look at low power and say what it is. But when, when I have a problem, I literally write down things that I'm seeing to remind myself what I've seen and then look at that list and say, okay, how can I put this together? Generally, you wanna to try to make one diagnosis, but every now and then you have to make two diagnoses to put everything together that you see. Uh, here is another question. How do you approach partially treated fibrotic lung disease? Can treatment change the pattern of fibrosis? Uh, okay, that's a very interesting question. Treatment can change the inflammatory infiltrates that are there. So I've seen a number of cases of treated eosinophilic pneumonia and the eosinophils are gone. In general, if you think you have true fibrosis, that is destruction of lung tissue, it's not going to reverse that. 
We're going to arrest fibrosis. If we're lucky with treatment, we're not going to reverse it. Now, if we have the general view of fibrosis, the broad view, and include organizing pneumonia, then treatment will affect the organizing pneumonia. But in actual clinical practice, we're not going to see a lot of specimens that are in the midst of treatment. You might see a specimen after somebody's been treated and they're doing it to look for an infection or something like that. But in general, we don't have a lot of information about what happens to lung after treatment. But if, if you believe fibrosis is there and it's a UIP pattern fibrosis, that's not gonna go away. Now, some of that quote NSIP fibrosis that's not quite as collagenized, I think some of that is reversible but I don't say that with, from biopsy knowledge, I say that from radiologic knowledge where the infiltrates appear to clear radiologically. There are not very many cases where you're gonna see serial biopsies so that you can know that what was there before has changed it in a later biopsy. We don't get a lot of autopsies these days. And even if we do, there's all sorts of pneumonia superimposed generally. So we don't really have a good way of knowing, uh, we don't really have se sequential tissue to address that question. And also, Tom, the point about sampling, which you and Bill Travis emphasize nicely in your discordant UIP paper, that, that you don't, you're not going to ever get the same site biopsy. It's always going to be someplace a little different. So you've got to ex accept some variability. If a patient had an early biopsy and has another one six months from now, you really don't, you can't really make the assertion that they are the exact same area undergoing change. Good point. So here is the next question. Um, what type of uh, fibrosis pattern we can expect in post COVID-19 era in transbronchial biopsies? <laughs> well, you know, Kevin and I have not seen a lot of COVID biopsies. And I think the short answer is we don't know. And if you listen to the national news, depending on who you listen to, everybody's worried about long-term effects of COVID. And I don't think we know those yet in terms of I, broadly speaking, I think some cases are going to look like the late phase of diffuse alveolar damage, but uh, I don't have a lot of experience with that. And I think that we as a community, as a pulmonary pathology community, are still in the process of following and assembling that information. I was at a uh, Zoom meeting last night with uh, some pulmonologists who are asking that exact same question. They said, so I've got a bunch of patients post-COVID who have ground glass infiltrates three or four months after they've recovered. And they said to me, well, what are we looking at? What are we seeing here in the CT? And I said, no one has any idea what that process is at this point. Yeah, I mean, you have to, I mean, we can't just biopsy patients for our own curiosity, much as we'd like to. Right. Right. Uh, the next question is, uh, are there any overlapping patterns of fibrosis or any of this pattern overlap at all? Oh yeah, that's an excellent question. And whenever we give a lecture like this in, in any kind, in any uh, uh, discipline in pathology, we tend to show classic cases and we tend to show distinct patterns. But in fact, all of these things overlap and not uncommonly I'm struggling with is this UIP type fibrosis or is this NSIP type fibrosis? And even as a quote expert, uh, I struggle with that. Not that often, but, but the answer is yes, these things overlap. And a good example of overlapping would be a patient who has usual interstitial pneumonia from idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and he gets an acute lung injury and you have an overlap of either DAD and UIP or if it's organizing DAD and I mean, organizing DAD and UIP. So yes, these things do overlap, but I think as I, as I said before, we should try to be splitters and we should try to think of these as pure patterns and address them from that point of view, acknowledging as, as was mentioned correctly, that there will be overlaps and you know that's why you get help. That's why you share cases around. Yeah, uh, I just saw a case just last week, Tom uh, shared with me of a patient who had classic UIP, 70 year old man, classic UIP on CT in the lower lobes, but also had upper lobe nodular disease. And it turned out it was a collision of sarcoidosis and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the unusual collisions will occur. Some inflammatory overlaps 
uh, that are unexpected will occur. And these are most of the reasons that we get sent the ILD case for consultation is that the, the findings don't make any sense pathologically and they suggest more than one possibility. Sorry, I was moving around. I spilled some coffee. <laughs> Computer's still working. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I missed the computer this time. <laughs> so uh, actually there are a couple of questions about granulomas and sarcoid. So maybe we can keep it after for the next lecture when uh, you will be discussing granulomatous diseases. Is that, is it okay? Perfect. Okay, so there is another question. Uh, it is uh, considering surgical biopsy, what is my best recommendation to the surgeon about where to do the sampling? Aha, good question. Uh, number one, you're awfully lucky that the surgeon actually talks to you and asks you where to do it. But putting that aside, the, the Brompton Hospital in London does this, and they don't do it on the basis of what the pathologist says, they do it on the basis of what the radiologist says. And places that do do directed sampling do it radiologically rather than what the pathologist asks for. As pathologist, you want the biggest piece you can get, obviously. It generally, it's said that you want both lobes biopsied on the left-hand side, all three lobes on the right-hand side. Most places will do two or three biopsies in most patients. But it's the radiologist who decides if anybody does. Most of the time, the surgeon is just going to do it they wing it themselves and do it and don't ask anybody. And they try to stay away from areas that we might consider uh, target rich because they don't like to biopsy areas that surge, the surgeon feels are fibrotic because they after they do the biopsy, they can get uh, air leak. Yeah, generally they will avoid honeycomb lung. But I think if the, if, the, if the surgeon does ask you, say that you would like a representative piece of lung that includes an area of scarring and an area of less affected tissue. In other words, a good representative sample. Right, uh, here is another question. Uh, do any of these IL, these cannot be diagnosed on forceps biopsy? Cases where the changes are predominantly in the periphery of the lung, or unapproachable location? Another interesting question, because if you look at your transbronchial biopsies and you do a calretinin stain, you'll find that they get the pleura in about 10 to 20% of cases. That's in a forceps biopsy. So they can go very peripheral. Same thing with a cryobiopsy. It's said that a cryobiopsy should come from the intermediate regions of the lung, but most places that do them successfully go very close to the pleura. And in a big series I've seen from Italy, 25%, I believe, of the cryobiopsies had pleura in them. So cryobiopsy and forceps biopsy can get to the periphery of the lung if the clinician chooses to go there, and they often do. Uh, here is another one. Uh, when we do not have the clinical information, is it correct to inform the injury pattern and give differential diagnosis? Yes, I think you, you do the best that you can with what you have. Remember, you know, this is our way of talking to our colleagues and we can't just say organizing pneumonia. I mean, we can, but I think it's useful as a pathologist to try to say the pattern identifies organizing pneumonia. This is a common pattern with a differential that includes X, Y, and Z, uh, clinical correlation suggested. Yes, no, I think it's useful to list a differential even if we don't know what's there. I think as Kevin said, we're gonna to try to tabulate the things that we see. And then if we, and then if we can do nothing, we can just say focal inflammation and fibrosis. That's common, but it, you know, we should try to go beyond that. We should try to say this looks more like a scarring pattern. This looks like organizing pneumonia. We should try to go as far as we can with the proviso that we don't have any information and we're just providing a differential. So the, one of the articles that uh, Tom had put in, in the talk, uh, the, the article on my approach to uh, ILD, that has tables in it that if you find an organizing pneumonia pattern, the things you should suggest in your report. And I wouldn't be afraid to copy and list those things. I've seen it done where people will say, look, I see this pattern and here's what the experts say in published material on this. Because 
I, I think if you can't come up with a list in from your own head, you got to get that list from some other source. Uh, here is another question. Uh, this is uh, so: Can UIP pattern be diagnosed on forceps biopsy or cryobiopsy confidently? Okay, uh, I would say on a, on forceps biopsy, there is some information out there that you can identify features that you see in UIP. Occasionally, you'll see honeycombing. Occasionally, you see a clear evidence of dense fibrosis. I don't think you can make a confident diagnosis of UIP. You can say something like uh, dense fibrosis that would be consistent with provided other things fit. Cryobiopsy, on the other hand, is big enough, five millimeters or bigger, it is big enough to show you a pattern. And usually in cryo patients, they'll do three, four, five biopsies. And putting those three or four or five specimens together, you can say, yes, I have the patchy pattern. I have honeycombing, I have fibroblast foci. Sometimes you can even say it's subplural. Now, you, you con your confidence level in a cryobiopsy is gonna be lower than a surgical lung biopsy. So in a cryo, I might, I might say, in a cryobiopsy, I might say, usual interstitial pneumonia with low confidence. Whereas a surgical lung biopsy, I'm rarely saying low confidence. I'm, mostly it's high confidence. So the confidence is gonna change a little bit even though you still see the pattern that you think you see. Uh, one last question. Smoking-related fibrosis, can it be a diagnosis by itself or is it a pattern or is it a part of a spectrum? Okay, um, interesting question. Well, smoking-related interstitial fibrosis is gonna be a common incidental finding that's asymptomatic and of no clinical significance. Sometimes it gets widespread and it makes patients ill with dyspnea and diffuse radiologic infiltrates. And I call those smoking-related interstitial lung disease. Katzenstein, who has written books about interstitial lung disease, would say, no, that's fibrotic NSIP in a smoker. It's, it's kind of a, a minor issue that pulmonary pathologists should worry about. But the short answer is yes, the smoking related changes, be it fibrosis or macrophages or combination of the two is not uncommonly widespread enough to cause a clinical disease. And I personally would put them under the umbrella of smoking related interstitial lung disease. And the thing you gotta be careful of is a lot of transbronchial biopsies are done for a target. They're actually going after something that made a nodule or a mass and they might hit lung tissue that has smoking related change. So you don't wanna overplay your hand in that setting, but you do need to list the finding as Tom said and say this in the, in the right context. And we would take it further. We'd say in the right context, meaning a patient with ground glass infiltrates and dyspnea, this could be smoking related interstitial lung disease. No, that, I, I, I'm glad that was brought up, Kevin, because if, it, if they're going after a mass lesion and all you see is smoking-related changes, yes, you have pathology, but no, you haven't answered the clinical question. Smoking-related changes don't explain a mass lesion. So that's, that's why that, you always want to know, what's the question I'm answering? If it's a mass lesion and you're thinking interstitial lung disease, then think again. I think uh, we can have one last question as well, that... Uh, the fibrosis, do you think the fibrosis can be affected by uh, phagocytosis of fibroblasts? I, I am not sure if I could get that question exactly correct. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I guess the question there is fibrosis in some way reversible from phagocytosis. I don't know if it if it's a UIP pattern fibrosis with dense collagen. To me, that's not reversible, be it by phagocytosis or lysis or whatever mechanism. Yeah, and for me, uh, if I don't if I see structural change with scar, uh, to me that's not reversible. But if I see only on organizing pneumonia, we all know that those can in fact evaporate. Now, how they evaporate is a subject of a whole lot of scientific research on apoptosis, on how uh, fibroblasts undergo a uh, resolution before- And there's college. often macrophages there, by the way. Exactly. So macrophages probably and likely play a, an important role. With organizing pneumonia, that, that could be.
I think with that, we have come to the end of this uh, uh, question sessions. And uh, thanks to Dr. Leslie and Dr. Kobe for this excellent discussion on this difficult topic. And uh, you would be really happy to hear that you had uh, hundreds of viewers who had defied time zone from so many different countries. I could at least keep track of some names just for record. Uh, viewers joined from Algeria, Colombia, Iran, Pakistan, uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Myanmar, Germany, Ecuador, uh, Mexico, to name a few, Egypt as well, and someone joined from Nigeria. So thanks to all our viewers for uh, your support. And if you like this lecture, so please follow our website that is pathologycast.com. Uh, where you can get all the lectures that are archived and you can get uh, access to the pdf for dr kobe's today's lecture and also the pdf of the lecture that was uh, for, uh, delivered by dr leslie last time so stay tuned to, to our upcoming lectures and you can subscribe to our newsletter so that you can stay updated with all the upcoming lectures and our next batch cast lecture is coming up. So that would be on October 9th. And that would be relevant to those uh, who are preparing for the boards. So that would be a microbiology lecture to be delivered by Dr. Margie Morgan from uh, Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And her talk will be on bacteriology, the part two of bacteriology. And it would be on Friday 9th, October 9th, 12 p.m. Eastern time. So hope to see you all and at that time and thank you again dr kobe and dr leslie and we would wait for your next uh, uh, lecture on non-neoplastic lung pathology and in that i think uh, you would be covering uh, granulomatous lung diseases so uh, till then thanks to all of you and thank you again thank you okay thank you